All right, welcome back to Science 102, starting online. And our first chapter online is our last chapter in physics. Um, so our last chapter in physics is on light. Um, so that's chapter seven. So let's get started. So the first thing to talk about here is sources of light. So there are two different kind of terms related to this. So one is luminous objects. So a luminous object is any object that produces light. So what I'd like you to think about are what kinds of objects do you know that actually produce their own light? So take a second, think about some examples of objects that you know that produce their own light. So one example, probably the best example of this, is the sun. Now, I'm also going to be posting my full PowerPoint, the one that I'm using here, just like I normally would with all of the notes that are in the uh, bottom section. So all of the answers for like examples and for problems and so forth will be posted there. Um, so luminous objects are those that pro actually produce light. Um, moons and planets, while well, the sun does produce its own light, moons and planets are not considered luminous objects because they don't produce light, they only reflect light from other, lum from other objects that are luminous. So the moon is bright and seems to have light, but only because it's reflecting light from the sun. Then there is a different term that we have related to light sources, which is incandescent sources. Um, so you can be a luminous source and an incandescent source because an incandescent source is one that gives off visible light due to high temperatures. Again, a great example of this is the sun uh, because big part of the reason why it gives off light is because of the fact that it is basically burning. Um, so I want you again to think of some examples of objects that you know that give off visible light due to their high temperatures. Um, a great example of this would actually be what we call an incandescent light bulb. Um, that's that typical light bulb that you can think of if you think about like if you're having an idea, the little light bulb that pops up over people's heads like in the cartoons. That's what we're thinking about as far as an incandescent light bulb here. Uh, because the reason why those work is because they're heating up an element inside to give off the light. And that's why if you've ever tried to take one of those out of a socket right after you've turned it off, it usually feels like it's going to burn. All right, so that's talking about sources of light. Light itself is actually what we call an electromagnetic wave. So if you remember from our last chapter, we saw in chapter six, there's a really tight connection between electricity and magnets. And light is the intersection of these two again. So light is an electromagnetic wave that's created by vibrating electric charges that have frequencies that fall within our range of sight. Um, there are electromagnetic waves, and we saw this before, the electromagnetic spectrum is actually a wide spectrum, we'll see that again here shortly, um, but light itself is only the ones that actually fall within what we can visually see. Um, and so the vibrations, uh, the frequency of the vibrating photons, and the photons are those actual charges, is going to equal the frequency of the light. Um, Keep in mind, light travels much faster than sound in air, um, nearly a million times faster. And you're familiar with this. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about sound. This is the idea that you're going to see lightning before you hear thunder. Um, and this is because of this huge change um, in difference between the traveling speed of light versus the traveling speed of sound. And just a reminder, we talked about waves at the beginning of the sound chapter. All light and electromagnetic waves are transverse waves. Again, those waves that travel like surface waves rather than the compression waves that we saw with sound. 
All right, so let's take a look at what these guys look like. So this is what an electromagnetic wave looks like. Remember when you get an electric field, a, a current that is moving, you get a magnetic field. And that's exactly what's happening here. You get vibrating electric and magnetic fields. They regenerate each other, creating electromagnetic induction. So you can see over here, you get a moving electric field that creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field reinforces the electric field that creates a magnetic field. And so they just keep reinforcing each other, creating each other as the wave travels. And so this is why we call them electromagnetic waves. As those um, electric, those photon particles are moving, they are generating that electric field, which in turn creates a magnetic field, which keeps those electric um, fields going. So I mentioned we've seen the electromagnetic spectrum before. We saw it back in the energy chapter. Here it is again. So we can see there is a change in the wavelength. So we've got longer wavelengths down on this end of the electromagnetic spectrum. And as we go from left to right, the wavelengths get shorter and the frequency changes. So you can see down here on the bottom, they also are showing frequency. Um, frequency for the electromagnetic spectrum is the same measurement as frequency was for sound. Um, it's measured in Hertz, as you can see here. Um, and so the low frequency matches up with low wavelength. High frequency, as you can see over here, matches up with the short wavelengths. And the visible light, the part that we're focusing on in this chapter, is right here in the middle. Um, but even within the visible light range, we have a range of frequencies. Uh, red of the visible light spectrum is going to be the lower frequency, the longer wavelengths, and purple or violet is going to be the shorter wavelengths or the higher frequencies. Um, on either side are going to be sections that you're familiar with. Um, oh, there we go. So visible light, only the small section of that spectrum. And as we talked about already, matter is constantly emitting and absorbing radiation from somewhere on the spectrum. So you may be getting exposed to visible light. Um, and so you're absorbing that. Most objects are then going to emit in the infrared. We don't generally emit in the visible, but we generally are going to emit in infrared because infrared is heat. Um, now we also can absorb in the ultraviolet and in the x-rays and the gamma rays. Generally, these aren't good for us. They are very high energy. Um, same thing we can absorb in these lower frequencies. These aren't so dangerous for us because they are lower energy with those lower frequencies. All right, so the next section here is talking about how light interacts with matter. So light is going to travel always in a straight path until it encounters an object. Um, it also will change its path if it encounters a different medium. So if you go from air to water or air to glass, um, and that's another property that we'll talk about in a little in another uh, video. The result of the interaction, so how that light is going to uh, interact or change is going to depend on a couple of different things. It's going to depend on the smoothness or the roughness of the object's surface. So if that object is really rough, that's going to change what is going to happen to the light versus if it's very smooth like a mirror. The nature of the object's material. So if it's something that is very um, shiny and metallic versus something that isn't, that's going to make a big difference on what the light is going to do. Um, the angle at which the light strikes the object surface. So if it strikes at a 90 degree angle versus a 20 degree angle, that is going to make a difference on how that is going to interact with the material. So there are generally some basic things that we see happen with our um, light when it interacts with matter. Uh, there are 
general interactions that always seem to happen. Um, so one inter possible interaction is absorption, and this is one that we're pretty familiar with. Um, so you can see that the light is coming in, that the incident light is the, the incoming light. Um, the arrows are always going to point in the direction that the light is going. So you can see the light is coming in towards the object, and here the absorbed light is just going to go into the object. You can see this is the absorbed light. It's just going to kind of fade away and be absorbed in. Um, absorption generally is going to be turned into another type of uh, energy like infrared. Transmission, um, that is the other section here, this arrow that's going all the way through the object. This is the transmitted light. Um, I don't know if you can see the transmitted section right behind my head here, um, but this is light that can go through objects. Um, reflection, so reflection is where the light comes in, but instead of either going through or being absorbed by the object, it's obviously going to get reflected or bounced off of the object. And so it's going to go in a new direction. Um, like I mentioned, there is another type of thing that can happen, refraction. Refraction is not shown here, um, but what refraction is, is it is what happens when you get uh, a change in material. So when you get uh, light traveling from, for example, air out here into the material, um, and we'll talk about this in a lot more detail later on, but it basically is the bending of light. Um, and you can see a little bit of that over here uh, because you can see that the light doesn't go into the object and come out at the same exact angle. And so we'll talk about that in a lot more detail later on. So the next thing to talk about is how different things can affect these properties of absorption, reflection, transmission. Um, so the big one is smoothness of surface. So how smooth a surface is will affect these different properties. So perfectly smooth surfaces are going to always undergo reflection. Um, they, the type of material may also absorb some of that depending on the property, but they will undergo reflection. So you can see that up in this guy right here. So we've got a perfectly smooth surface. This could be like water. Um, if you can think of other examples, um, you know, mirror is another common example of a very smooth surface that would undergo reflection of light rays. However, rough irregular surfaces like the picture that we have farther down here where like you've got grass or um, you've just got bumps in the surface, these are going to create still reflection because you can see that the light rays come in and they bounce off, but they create what we call diffuse reflection because not all of the light rays bounce in the same direction. So up here you can see that on A when it's smooth, all the light rays come in at the same angle and they all bounce off at the same angle. However, down here in B, where the surface is rough, what you get is they all come in at the same angle, but then they all bounce off in different directions. Um, and this causes, like I said, what we call diffuse reflection. It's still a reflection, but it causes a new property. And so you're actually familiar with this idea of diffuse reflection because most of our objects in our world are actually visible because of diffuse reflection. So if you look over here at this tree, you've got light coming in and it hits the section of the tree and each point on the tree is going to reflect light out in all different directions. It's not just going to reflect it out in one point because that part of the tree isn't perfectly smooth. It is rough. And so it's going to point it out in all different directions. So that means you can see the tree from different angles. You don't have to be in one spot to be able to view the tree. 
This is also why it's not going to be completely dark underneath the tree because the light is going to get bounced under the tree and be able to light up the area under the tree. If you've ever been into like a dark forest or something like that, that's why you can still see even though you've got these big tall trees 